All right. It's just after 4.20 p.m. Eastern. That means it's time for office hours. This is Arroyo's weekly session for cultivators to hear from the experts and talk to each other about what they're seeing with their grows. My name is Keisha. I'll be co-moderating moderating today with my good friend, Mandy. How are you, Mandy? Hey, Keisha. Got a question. You can go ahead and type it in our chat at any time. If it's chosen, we'll have you go ahead and unmute yourself and ask away. We're also over on our Arroyo YouTube channel going live and taking questions over there. So I'm going to be monitoring, monitoring for those. Uh, go ahead and, and head over there and subscribe to make sure you're always in the loop with our cultivation education. Uh, we got a lot of questions this week, so let's not waste any more time. Back to you, Keisha. Awesome, Mandy. Thank you so much. And just to let everybody know out there, first time question askers, we are giving, uh, giving out some swag. And everybody on today, we'll have a chance to win a limited edition or a t-shirt drop your email address in the chat to enter jason how you doing today i'm doing pretty well how are you i'm good good to see you are you ready for our first question from instagram uh sure let's okay. do it yes excellent this one came from canna ray they asked do we ever have to calibrate the terrace 12 or atmos 14 if so when and how do we go about it yeah, let's get started. Terrace twelves, we calibrate them in the factory, and the calibration should be good for the duration of the life of the sensor. So, no calibrations should ever be needed on the the Terrace twelves. For the Atmos fourteens, uh, we do recommend that some of our clients adjust or send them in for calibration every two years. That being said, they have very minimal accuracy drift on them. So for relative humidity, we're looking at 025 uh, percent relative humidity drift per year. And for temperature, it's 0.03% uh, or 0.03 degrees Celsius drift per year. So realistically, you know, every two years is probably more than precautionary just to make sure the calibration is, is still accurate. Uh, but in, in the reality is that the long-term accuracy of those shouldn't be affected. Amazing. It's great to uh, be working for a company that's been developing these sensors for so many decades, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Um, our good friend Bilbo Bags 420 actually sent a couple questions about sensors. I'm going to run by you, Jason. Um, this is a good one. Um, he wants to know, can I add other meter group sensors directly into my Arroyo platform using a ZL6? Great question. Uh, so currently in our production platform, uh, that that's not available. We're only supporting sensors via the noses and repeaters and climate stations. Uh, however, we have done some work in the past with a few development partners where we are connecting things like the Taros 21 tensiometer, uh, the Atmos 41 uh, climate station, uh, all through the ZL6 for some, some outdoor exploratory market action. So um, possibly in the future at some point that that will be available in the production, but, but currently it's just in our development environment. Fantastic. Thank you. Mandy, I think we have a question from YouTube. Yeah. Yep. I was just seeing that one. Um, so yeah, I'll go ahead and ask, um, I believe it's Dylan's question. Um, can you guys explain what's the benefits from defoliation? Uh, it's that increase our, <laughs> sorry, we, I didn't clean this one up yet. Uh, uh, that increase our yield somehow, or just make our bottom buds a little bigger. If it's, if it's increase our yield, what's the best time to defoliate? Sorry, I can go through that one again. Can you guys explain what's the benefits from defoliation uh, that increase our yield somehow or just make our bottom bud, buds bigger? If it's increase our yield, what's the best time to defoliate? Yeah, great question. And I think maybe four episodes ago, we did some pretty in-depth on defoliation. I'll just cover the, the basis is on our thoughts with, with defoliation there. So really what it comes down to is, is maximizing the potential of the plant via the resources that are available. So if we're seeing a really thick canopy and it's blocking out um, some light down to the lower canopy, you're exactly right. We're going to get more light for your buds down bottom. Um, and so when we ask about more yield, you know, if we can get possibly a higher level of a quality buds, there's a good chance that we are going to get more yield, um, at least more sellable product out of that plant. And so it's really a fine balance. We're looking at obviously, uh, labor as a very costly input for, 
defoliating. Uh, sometimes it takes, you know, days to do defoliation through a larger room. And, uh, and then the, the other aspect there is that uh, it does signal the plant to be a little bit more vegetative when uh, when we defoliate it. So it's going to change the hormone impact when uh, when that thing uh, loses some of its leaves. And so really, it's it's a fine balance with with all this crop steering stuff. You know, you don't want to go too far. Um, you know, some strains aren't necessarily going to need much for defoliation, while while others are going to be so full and thick out that uh, you want to make sure that you're getting that done in order to produce the the most high quality bud that you can. Um, you know, some of our favorite times of, of defoliation would be you know, around the three week mark, just to get those plants all all cleaned up. Um, usually, that's you know in line somewhere around the end of vegetative or excuse me with generative um, stacking. And like I said, it just all depends on the strain. So, you know, our timeframes for gender stacking is going to be different for different strains. The amount of defoliation is, is different. So the best thing that you can do is be looking at things like, um, under canopy lighting. Uh, so leaf area index, how much light do we see going through, uh, that canopy document the stuff in, in your session, uh, in your user or your harvest group, um, in Arroyo and, one of the things that does is then you can go back and take a look. Hey, if we modify how much we defoliate, what happens to our total weight and what happens to our ratio of, of a buds to, um, to some of the lower quality product coming off of that plant. Awesome. Thanks, Jason. Um, he actually had a follow-up question too. Uh, and what's the point of defoliation if the fan leaves make more photosynthesis than sugar leaves, why pull them? Uh, why do we pull them away if the plants eat from them the most? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, plant biology obviously um, usually the leaves aren't going to cannibalize any of the energy that's going into the plant. Um, but that being said, newer leaves are more efficient at photosynthesizing, and if we have you know enough light in there and it is hitting all the leaf surfaces, then we may not need to defoliate. But, uh, but there are obviously advantages to cleaning those plants up, getting better airflow so you can manage your environment in that canopy. And then, like, like we said, also to try and help raise the, the ratio of AFA buds coming off the plant. Awesome. Thank you for that. Um, we had one more come in from YouTube. Uh, Power Hash wants to know, how should, the media, how should the media be when we defoliate? Do you have any advice for that? I guess he's asking about like water content or, or EC in the substrate. I don't necessarily think that you, there's any benefit to correlating um, substrate conditions with defoliating. As long as those plants are growing in a, in a healthy substrate, then uh, then it's going to be a good time to defoliate when you see that, that canopy coverage get a little bit out of control. Awesome. Thank you for that. Um, we're getting a lot of shout outs over there too. Uh, hello guys. Um, we got people call, uh, shouting out from Hawaii. Yeah. Um, yeah. And sharing some crop steering knowledge over there on YouTube. So uh, yeah, keep it going over there guys. Thanks. Uh, like Keisha, back to you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Mandy. Love to see it. Love keep those questions coming. And the folks who are on with us here live on, on hangouts, please do post your questions in the chat. We want to hear from you too. We're already deep into crop steering. So let's keep that party started. Um, um, another part, uh, question from Bilbo Bags 420. Um, he's asking, what is the difference between the matrix potential of water in high CEC substrate versus low? Thoughts on that, Jason? Sure. Uh, so let's just jump in and do a quick explanation on on the terminology there. Uh, matrix potential is going to be talking about the amount of vacuum that the roots have to apply to a substrate in order to pull water out of it. And then CEC being cation exchange capacity. So how much does the specific characteristics of the substrate hang on to the ions of nutrients in solution? And so, you know, I always like to take a look at the spectrum of things that are high CEC uh, versus low CEC and uh, different medias that are, uh, you know, have a different matrix potential curve. And so when we look at something like rock wool, the matrix potential curve is very linear. And so we can pull most all the water content out of that before the plants are actually feeling uh, a stress, a vacuum stress in those roots. Then if we go into to a different substrate, um, you know, let's take clay, for example. Uh, clay can still have a fairly high amount of water content, and yet the vacuum applied to that substrate needs to be relatively high. Uh, and so that plant can definitely feel 
some irrigation stresses before it's necessarily even seeing a low water content in that substrate. Uh, so obviously, in these time we're working with uh, most of the modern hydroponic materials, uh, you know, rock wool, cocoa. Typically, their matrix potentials are, are a little bit more lenient. Like, you know, we, we're not necessarily worried about water stressors. A lot of times we're actually worried more worried about jeopardizing the uh, properties of that substrate. So for rock wool, for example, we really never want to go lower than 30%, probably not lower than maybe 35 or 40%, just because it can start to build uh, hydrophobic pockets. Uh, you'll start to see irrigation channeling, that type of thing. Um, cation exchange capacity. So Rockwell has almost no cation exchange capacity. It is extraordinarily inert. If we look at in, uh, on the other side of the spectrum, more organic types of substrates, usually they have a much higher CEC. And so, you know, one of the things there is, you know, if we're in a large organic substrate, it's going to take us a lot longer in order to adjust the nutrient properties of that substrate um you know and working with synthetic nutrients in something like rock wool you know, we can up and decrease those nutrient contents very quickly uh you know they're directly metabolized by the plant whereas you know for organics it's uh, a breakdown uh, those nutrients are, are being catalyzed into other uh, other chemical formulas in order to be uptaken by the plant they don't necessarily, you know, CEC and matrix potential don't necessarily have a direct correlation. You know, they're two very separate properties that are specific to each type of media. And, you know, you can have a, a media that's got a higher CEC and a lower matrix potential and vice versa. You know, really, really what's going on there is just taking advantage of the specific properties of the substrate that you're working in. All super important concepts to know and keep in mind. Uh, thank you for that, Jason. We have like five more questions that came in since that question started uh, over on our YouTube. So I'll go ahead and get to those. Um, Greg wants to know, do we have any advice for dryback and EC for Black Hawaii pumice lava substrates? Black Hawaii pumice. All right. Black Hawaii lava pumice. Um not specifically. I can't say I've ever worked with it or, or seen much of it. Uh, typically, you know, pumices are, uh, they don't have very much for the, the actual water retention capacity. You know, the amount of water that you can get in there is very high because they are extraordinarily porous. Um, you know, they are going to dry out faster than something that has a, a more exponential matrix potential curve. Um, so it would hang on to the water a little bit lower. So that's, you know, a, a nice hydroponic media that is going to be very, um, very steerable. Awesome. Uh, yeah, we have a ton, so I'll just keep going down the list. Um, CMDR, Mr. Grinch wants to know, does the panel have a preference for, oh, and they're asking each other um, now. So hold on. Uh, we have a ton of back and forth. Powerhash says hi from Barcelona, Spain. You guys are doing an amazing job. Um, Donald wants to know, can we clarify generative stacking? Sure. So, you know, when we talk about, uh, generative or vegetative, we're just usually talking about the um, different properties that we're trying to take advantage of a plant. So we're steering its physiological response for the ideal morphological response. So when we're doing generative stacking, it's trying to encourage a more reproductive type of growth in that plant. So what we're looking at is stacking some of the nutrient content, if you will, letting that rise up by reducing our runoffs and having a reduced number of irrigations over the day, that shorter irrigation window that we always talk about. And um, yeah, so, you know, really what we're shooting for is a decreased uh, node spacing, you know, trying to keep that plant from stretching out too much. And Disclaimer, as we always talk about, it's very strain specific. Some strains uh, are already generative leaning and they may not need nearly as much of that uh, that stacking steering in towards the beginning. And and some plants, you know, something like a blue drain would be a very stretchy plant where we're going to pull the generative stacking out for a few weeks in order to control the shape of the plant and get the most product as we can. Great. Thanks for that. Um so Diane wants to know, and he says, thanks, Jason, for the information uh, earlier. Um, what are your thoughts about lowering our PPFD levels around week seven of flowering so that they can be finished better? Are they finished better? What are your thoughts? 
you know, I, I don't necessarily go for lower and PPFD. Um, you know, we've, we've built up a big plant that can handle a significant amount of photosynthesis. We, you know, we're at the point where the, the plants still are producing bud mass. And so I want to get them as much energy as I have previously. Now, if you can adjust the spectrum of your lights, the, you know, the science has shown that a little bit more far red uh, kind of emulates fall and does help those plants ripen up. Awesome. And we also have a follow-up question. What's the most common reason for foxtailing? I'm 6.0 CC EC in the medium and 1200 PPFD and leaf temperature is uh, 80 Fahrenheit. Uh, Fahrenheit. Uh, it's, can that, wait, can that be causing foxtails or can it be my high nitrogen in the mixing tank? Yes and yes uh, and yes. Uh, Genetically speaking, there's strains that are much more susceptible to foxtailing. Usually it's a, you know, a slight stress response, uh, or, or we can see it happen when we're, um, having more vegetative type of, of growth towards the end, or even if we're just trying to ripen up a plant a little bit faster than we really should. Um, so there's quite a few things that are going to come into play with foxtailing. You know, the best thing that I would do is go, go back and look at previous harvest groups. What were the the variables different in there that didn't lead to fox tailing and, and trying to target that uh, practice for each of those strains. Dropping the knowledge today, loving all of these amazing questions. Sean typed a question here in our chat. Sean, do you want to unmute yourself and ask away? And if not, I'd be happy to answer for you or ask. I'm sorry, I can't answer. That's Jason. <laughs> okay, I'll go ahead and ask. Um, so Sean writes, when I only have one terrace 12 sensor for my four to eight trays, where on the tray would be best to place the sensor? In the middle of the trays, side or front? Your, your advice there. Ah, uh, that's going to be a little tricky. And that's why we always like to have more sensors is because it, it does help us build an average, you know, depending on how wide your aisles are. A lot of times your edge plants are going to see a little bit more light you know, as it's coming off at an, at an angle from the, the lights and, and being able to penetrate through that canopy a little bit deeper. Uh, a lot of times you also see a little bit more airflow on those outside plants. So, you know, typically we would think about plants around the outside of the tray um, having a, a little bit higher water usage, um, than the ones towards the middle. Um, you know, and that's why when we have more than one sensor, we like to have some towards the inside of the canopy and, and some towards the outside of the canopy. If you have one, you know, the, the best thing to do is pick middle ground, um, and, or, you know, realize how the performance of those plants might differ depending on that sensor location and keep that mentally on, on the top of your brain when you're making irrigation adjustments uh, based on that data. Awesome. Thank you, Jason. Uh, we are still getting questions over on YouTube. Uh, Raymond wants to know, can you guys update us on the open sprinkler integration with Arroya? Sure. So I currently have... Um, 14 open sprinklers on beta client sites that, that are actively doing. I think there is a little over 40 irrigation schedules that are set up uh, on, our, on our test environments for open sprinkler integration. Uh, performance wise, it's extremely reliable. We've seen it performing as intended with the beta versions. We are currently working to clean up the interface uh, so that, that we're really happy with it and it's as user friendly as possible when we do the full launch. Um, so we're, we're, you know, we're a couple months out from opening up that release to the public. Awesome. Well, that's super exciting. Um, yeah, we're just going to keep going down our list of questions. Um, man, we have a ton from Instagram this week. Um, I'm going to go back to Bilbo Baggins. Um, does Arroya set up my system or do I set the system up uh, after I buy from Arroya? Yeah, so a little, little bit of each of that. Um, physically, uh, cl our clients do the installation. We, you know, we spent a lot of development time in the early days of Arroya, making sure it's as user friendly as possible for setup. So, you know, the installation is really pretty simple. You get your gateway online by connecting it to um, your local area network, your internet, 
you know, wired into the network at your facility. You know, once that thing's online, you can start putting up your your repeaters and your climate stations to ensure that you're going to have good signal across the facility. And then for the sensors themselves, they're wireless. So it's usually a fairly painless install. What you do is get them turned on by, by tapping the button on the face of it uh, three times and it'll flash green when it's on. Um, get it stuck into the, the substrate nice and well. Obviously, we do send our installation template tool, which is specific for different sizes of medias, so you can get as accurate uh, as water content as possible throughout that uh, that substrate. Um, yeah, as far as you know, on our end, what we do is onboarding schedule. So meet with our client success team. They'll get your facility all drawn out, um, allocate um, your zone spaces, and just make sure that the interface accurately represents your facility. They'll talk to you about making sure that the installation of the sensors went well, give you any help that you need there physically and, uh, and check that everything's online and reporting. And the next steps from there is, is basically getting an understanding of, um, data interpretation. Uh, so meet up with them, um, you know, week after two weeks after you get installed and, and start, uh, taking a look at the data and, and what it represents and as far as improvements that are available for irrigation environment and uh, any of the other parameters that we can we can tell. So if you're doing manual inputs, like I always recommend that crop registration is is key to attributing what we can't see with sensors. Great. Um, we got another question over on YouTube. Marlon wants to know what would cause plants to start vegging again in week seven after dropping EC and raising pH? Uh, you know, possibly just dropping that, that EC would, would cause them to be a little bit more vegetative. Um, typically, you know, when we look at the osmotic potential, um, the lower that osmotic potential between the plant and the substrate, the more generative it's going to be, the, the higher that potential. So the plant's already saltier than the substrate usually. So when we drop that, it's going to increase that, uh, osmotic potential and the plant's likely to uptake a little bit more water. So that could contribute to um, to some vegetative response. Wonderful. Um, the chat is popping. I'm loving it. Michael, you have a question. You want to unmute yourself and ask it or you want me to ask for you? I'll just, I'm going to dive right in. If you want to chime in, feel free. Uh, understood. Poor signal. We've been there. Michael wants to know, uh, he writes, when transitioning to a new food program with a similar balance, is there any advantage to waiting for any specific day or phase of flower to switch? Oh, that's pretty specific. I, I mean, if the composition is very similar, you know, the plants don't necessarily care if it's brand A or brand B. Um, that being said, you know, without a, a, chemical composition breakdown of the nutrients, there is going to probably be some small differences, you know, either it is in the, the macro ratios of NPK or if it's in the uh, content of, of micronutrients uh, in that. So, you know, without knowing the chemical composition, it's really hard to, to predict when would be the best or, or how that's going to affect the plants. I mean, I, ideally you don't switch variables in the middle of a run. Um, that way that you have some reference data on, you know, A versus B testing when, you know, there's a sol single piece of, of data um, or a single variable that's not changed. So if, if we are making a change midstream, it's, it's hard to understand, A, is that related to that change or is it related to some other variable that we might be analyzing? Great. Thank, Michael, thank you for your question. If you um, have anything you want to add or clarify, feel free to drop it in the chat and we can we can come back to it. All right, Mandy, what you got from YouTube? Man, they're just rolling in. Um, yeah, Diane wants to know, um, and sorry if I butcher this, what should be our DIF, DIF, on cannabis plants? Are they benefits from the collar nights or can we go the same temperature day and night? Jason, did you get that one? I'm thinking yeah. he means cooler night. Cooler? Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, that's what I'm guessing. Yep. Yeah. And so, you know, this question is asking about uh, nighttime differential. So night, day, temperature differential in a room. Uh, with, with cannabis, you know, people that do like the purple coloring, we can obviously encourage some of the anthocyanin. It's the um, chemical that's responsible 
for more purpling in there. It's actually the same chemical that we see in blueberries and huckleberries uh, that make them purple. And so, you know, as, as far as, um, you know, if you, if you don't need purpling, you might run a, a little bit lower, lower differential. My, my favorite kind of rule of thumb is just to break it into three sections and go with a, a zero degree night day diff for the first third of flower. And for the second third of flower, go with, uh, you know, five degree diff and then, um, last third of flower usually go for about a 10 degree difference. And obviously that's as general rule of thumb as I can get to be helpful, uh, without looking at the, you know, the strain response specifics, how long that cycle is and, and other variables going on in that harvest group. Awesome, Jason. Thank you. I'm just going to keep on going. All right. Eric wrote into us uh, this week. He wrote, uh, I have a crop steering question for you. Love your office hours and wish I could ask them, but I can never make the time. So we hear you, Eric. Thanks for writing in. Um, growing into gal cocoa, and I've had no problem nutrient stacking when I need to, but what techniques can I use to keep substrate EC low in week eight and also get large drybacks? Sure. Um, so a couple things that we can do there would be obviously having a, a generative ripening type of strategy where our irrigation window is shorter. If we're trying to keep that EC low, um, you know, and we only have maybe uh, five days, you know, three days, maybe a week left uh, of that ripening, obviously we can push a little bit more runoff to drop that EC. And, you know, if the, the plants are getting close to the end of the life, we can actually reduce the amount of EC. So as a general rule, we we don't really like to go to straight RO, um, you know, looking at zero or, or very low EC, but, uh, but if you need to drop that EC and you can't do it with just runoff, you know, go to three quarter strength or half strength nutrients. Great. Thanks for that. Um, so over on YouTube, CMDR, Mr. Grinch wants to know, do you have any advice for this, Jason, phosphoric acid or sulfuric acid for a pH down? Um, it's kind of up to, to you, you know, what the suppliers can do. I, I personally like phosphoric acid better for, uh, for pH adjustment. Um, you know, one of the things you do want to just kind of keep an eye on is how much pH drift you see from the specific nutrient or the specific pH adjuster, the specific acid that you're using. Uh, and then also think about how that affects your nutrient composition as well. So if, you know, we're looking at NPK and the, the supply, if we're using phosphoric acid, we might have a little bit more uh, available phosphor. Awesome. Great. Yes. Keep those questions coming, folks. Another one from Instagram here. Um, this is from Tristan Alk. They want to know, how relevant are runoff measurements compared to actual substrate EC? Great question. Um, and this, I mean, this comes down to the basis of migrating how we look at substrate conditions. Uh, obviously traditionally runoff is one of the best tools that we can use for making sure that our ECs are where we want them to be. Uh, some of the challenges with runoff readings is just simply been getting the labor to provide a good sampling of those runoff readings. Uh, you know, another challenge is obviously you don't know the substrate conditions if you're not pushing any runoff. Right. Um, so there, there are a few things there that can be a little bit tricky. Whenever people start to use Arroyo, one of my favorite ways to approach this would be continue taking your runoff readings, you know, input those manual readings into Arroyo and then just do some comparisons. You know, what's the EC that I see in the substrate? What's my, my runoff EC looking at? You know, if you're taking that runoff reading once a day, you know, compare with what the substrate EC is at that point and use that kind of as a, a general steering method. And after you get used to uh, the difference from runoff EC and, and in situ substrate EC, uh, you can probably start to reduce how much labor inputs are going into runoff ECs. And I've had a lot of customers, uh, you know, completely move away from runoff readings other than pH. Awesome. Um, moving back over to some of our YouTube questions that just keep pouring in. Um, Diane wants to know, do we need to supplement our UV lighting for indoors or are there not any benefits for our cannabinoids and THC? What do you recommend? Uh, I'd recommend go check out some Bruce Bugby's videos uh, on YouTube. Uh, he's, he's the light master when it comes to uh, some of the research in, in cannabis. 
with uh, UV input to other types of uh, plants, you know, there, there are some uh, growth benefits early on for vegetative response with, with UV, um, you know, without knowing the specific spectrum that is being utilized in the first place, we don't necessarily know even how much UV we would want to supplement at that point. So there's, there's a lot of research to be be done here. Um, you know, if you want to just Google search photomorphogenesis, uh, one of my most favorite topics to dig into because there's always something fun to learn uh, about how those spectrums can affect the different plant responses and the different time frame within the response and, and their growth cycle. So uh, no easy answer there. Sorry. But so passionate and weed nerdy, which is like my thing. I love it. Thank you, Jason. <laughs> All right. Justin posted a question here and he asked, short of the full sensor and data capture suite from Arroya that is only available to licensed commercial growers, what is an individual grower to do who is limited to only a solace that only measures substrate moisture and EC? That's his first question. So why don't we start there? Um, yeah, start start logging that data. Um you know, in a Excel, Excel spreadsheet. Uh, if you've got a lot of cultivars that are running in there, then it obviously does compound the, the trickiness on how much effort you're putting into it. More cultivars means that you're going to need more samples to, to get a, a really good idea of what's going on in there. And then obviously, you know, without, without time series data, it's nice to um, also capture you know, a specific and consistent time when you are reading that substrate. So if you're doing it just before, irrigation is probably a good way to go. And then probably just after your irrigations are finished and, and you've seen runoff pushed through the substrate. Thank you for that, Jason. And for, regarding his second question, I know we've covered this a few episodes ago, but maybe we can give folks a little bit of a rundown on, on the clients that we work with because of the nature of our product. Yeah, um, absolutely. So, you know, right, right now, because of the radios that we're using in there, um, our FCC licenses only allow our product to be used for commercial um, usage. And so we don't have obviously the Arroyo suite for uh, for home growers at this point. There, you know, there's a, a good chance that when we, we revise and we have a, a more compliant radio in the chip that we could open up to home growers. Uh, we do have kind of what we call the, the uh, grow house suite in our development process, in our roadmap, where we are trying to optimize the the software for that type of thing when the time does come that we can provide hardware to home growers. Awesome, thank you for that. All right, Mandy, who's next? Yeah, so over on YouTube, Donald is asking, during generative stacking, could you provide a high limit of EC for runs? In general, how high can we go with EC stacking? Uh, yeah. So let's look at EC dynamics. You know, if you're capturing some time series data on EC, then there's really two answers to that question. And the first one is talking about what is your refresh EC? So what's the, what's the EC that we see, uh, after our irrigation and we've pushed out, uh, some of the nutrients, if we are doing runoff, um, if we're not doing runoff, just how has the new solution modified the EC of the substrate. And so, you know, that, that would be basically, your, you know, your baseline EC. And then simply because we are pushing generative and we have a really long dryback window, we can see that EC substantially rise, right? And typically the faster that's rising, the more dramatic generative impact that the plant is feeling. And, uh, you know, EC numbers in there, Realistically, that uh, that baseline for after irrigation, you know, five to eight is a, a rough number for a lot of the um, commercial two part salts that we see um, on the on the high side. Uh, you know, I don't usually get too concerned as long as they're not spending much time right right at that really high numbers. Um, you know, every once in a while I see 15 to 20 and I don't get too scared as long as the the plant substrate is refreshed back down to that lower EC on, on a daily basis. Great. Thank you for that. All right. Forrest dropped a question in the chat. Forrest, can, you want to unmute yourself and ask? You want me to ask for you? 
I can go ahead and ask. And then if you want to try, oh, great. Perfect. All right. Forrest writes, cultivars that require longer gen, should we try to push the EC as high as possible in rock wool? For example, a diesel strain. Uh, as high as possible? Probably not. I mean, if we wanted to go really high, we can just put a lot more salt, uh, a lot more nutrients in the, the feed EC. Uh, if you are just keeping with the same feed EC, uh, a lot of times, you know, if you've got very minimal runoff and you do get, you know, a slight increase day to day in, in that, that means that you've got uh, a good choice. Um, and, you know, if you're running generative for, you know, say, like five weeks, I probably wouldn't get want to get too carried away. You know, if, if you're seeing uh, your daily refreshes not go under 10, then then you might consider uh, getting a little bit more runoff in those irrigations. Awesome. Forrest, thank you so much for your question. Drop your email address in the chat so we can send you a hat. I didn't mean a rhyme, but it just worked out. All right. Going back to Instagram over here. Um, Los Green Goss wants to know if there's a required pH for foliar feed feeding and how should the media be when doing foliar sprays? Yeah. Um, you know, I, what we're looking at with foliar sprays is, you know, there's a, most of the time the, the best foliar sprays are, are really, um, pest sprays, right? We're looking at integrated pest management type of sprays, nutrient, um, foliar sprays. There's not a lot of, chemicals that are absorbed through the, the plant skin. I mean, it's kind of like a human being, right? I'm sure I can put a, a topical on my skin. Uh, the absorption rate is going to be much, much lower than if, if I drink it. Um, and, and so that is, you know, something to kind of keep in mind is, is what is the purpose of your foliar spray? Uh, as far as the, you know, the pH, probably not super important just because like I said, it's, it's not, you know, interacting with the substrate. It's not getting directly uptaken through the, the plant's inner cells. Uh, it is being just slightly absorbed through the plant. Um, you know, I, I probably would be pretty happy anywhere between your, your feed pH and, and just basic or just, um, neutral 7.0. Uh, so I, if, you know, if you spend a lot of time trying to perfect that, um, might be wasted energy. Uh, if anyone else has thoughts on this, it's not something I've looked at in specific. Um, you know, let, let us know what your experience is with full air pH. Yeah, you, you guys heard the call. We'd love to hear from you. What's working for you with foliar pH? Let us know. In the meantime, moving on to our next Instagram question. This is from Carlos Dopamine OX. Foraflex and Athena have high strength schedules. Starting seed, seedlings off is 3.0. Early acclimation? That's his question. Yeah, probably. I mean, just making sure that the plants have as much nutrients as they need for the, the fastest growth possible. Uh, cannabis is one of the most aggressively growing plants, uh, that, that we do in, in horticulture. And so, uh, you know, it's probably going to be more of a hamper to have too low EC than, than too high of EC. Uh, you know, usually if we see nutrient burn, it's more likely related to a nutrient imbalance and we have, uh, you know, an excess of one nutrient that's blocking out the absorption of, of some other nutrients. You know, fortunately there's quite a few high quality nutrients, um, on the market right now. And so that's why they can get away with a little bit higher EC than, than what we're used to. Um, I would probably follow their recommendations. Great. Thanks for that. Um, Forrest submitted another question in our chat. I can go ahead and ask that one. Do you find many cultivars suffer from nitrogen toxicity in rock wool when running Athena ProLine? Um, I haven't run into it. I, I mean, there's tens of thousands of situations that I have worked through. Um, easiest way to tell, uh, send in a leaf for tissue analysis. Um, that, that'll give you a, a very surefire information on what, whether you are seeing nitrogen toxicity for sure and what the, the levels of um, nutrient composition all around that, that plant are hitting. So sometimes, you know, a toxicity can also be a um, deficiency 
of another nutrient, for example, as, as that uptake is being blocked by an excess. So that's definitely the, the best way to check it out. Um, and then just kind of in general, when, when I am talking about these numbers uh, and, and giving advice, it is so very dependent on all the factors that are going on into your grow. You know, when we're looking at environment, you know, when I'm generalizing numbers, we're just talking about the best environment with these plants that, that we know of uh, across the span of uh, the genetic rainbow. And when we're talking about EC levels, you know, maybe there are certain types of, of strains that don't like to start off at 3.0 with your Athena. Best thing you can do is you know, log your data uh, as possible and log the response of those plants with you know, plant heights. Pictures are my favorite just because there's so much information that can be derived from a picture. Maybe you're not even sure what you want to be looking at at that point, but you can go back and reference uh, how that plant was responding uh, when you're diagnosing a specific type of uh, the issue in your growth cycle. And, uh, and so please, yeah, keep that stuff in mind. You know, when we're talking about those EC levels, uh, I'm just trying to go middle of the road when what you need to do is, is document and log harvest group to harvest group, make some continuous small tweaks and, uh, try and only limit the number of variables that you're modifying between those. So you're, you're not chasing your tail, you know, any kind of time we're looking at compounding variables, there's, there's not always a correlation directly between both of them, and it makes it hard to make a, a great choice based on uh, more than one type of process being changed through the cycle. Thanks for that. Uh, Forrest, you'll have to let us know if you have any follow-up questions or if that answered everything. Um, we do have a question that came in on YouTube a couple of minutes ago that I did skip over by accident. Uh, Diane wants to know... Should we be using silicic acid in the roots or can we use potassium silicate silicate because it's cheaper? Do you have any advice for that? Um, it is good to, you know, something like power Psi for those roots, you know, it does help create some robustness and, and defenses in the plant to, um, pests, et cetera. Um, as far as, you know, how that gets uptaken in the plant, I don't have a great chemical background on, on which is, is going to be more soluble to the plant. Um, give it a try, see what your plants like. And obviously sometimes when a product is cheaper, you actually have to use more of it. And then, uh, and then you're either putting the rest of the solution out of balance and, or you're just spending more money, um, than you, than you would be. So a lot of times, you know, keep that in mind as well as that, uh, that it's not always one to one. If I'm using you know 50 milligrams per gallon of a specific type, then it's not always going to be the the same effectiveness of a, a different. Awesome, Jason, you're holding it down. Just you, amazing. All right, our next question from Instagram, and I'm going to have to phrase it a little bit here. So, um, at Fur RH wrote in that they share a room for veg and moms, but only have irrigation system for veg. And they posted something about irrigation strategy. Would it, would it be the same to try to achieve crop steering on the moms? Does that make sense? Sure. Yeah, it does. So they have, uh, you know, ability to set one irrigation schedule for both their vegging plants and their mom plants. Um, and the only time that we really talk about crop steering with moms is trying to achieve as many cuttings as possible. And, and typically that's going to be, you know, related to uh, vegetative growth. And so I would definitely focus on crop steering your, your veg plants. And then, you know, just making sure that you're not getting uh, water contents out of control or ECs out of control with those mom plants. And a lot of times, you know, you're, you're either going to have to use a, a different dripper rate on those moms, more or less drippers on those moms, or possibly adjust your mom uh, substrate size in order to, to balance for that handicap. Great. Uh, we had a question come in over on YouTube. Marlon wants to know, Generative or regenerative irrigation for flush? Uh, well, I, I don't necessarily, I'm not familiar with the specifics of what regenerative irrigation is. Obviously, you know, we like to type it, we like to talk about it as generative ripening simply because, uh, you know, flushing can have some, some connotation that's not necessarily specific. You know, is it goal related? Is it just going straight to RO? 
Uh, so when we talk about generative ripening, we will talk about you know, large drybacks, uh, that shorter irrigation window. And uh, a lot of times, if you can, you know, drop in your, your EC to three quarter or half strength and, and tapering that down. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jason. Um, so this is the last question we have from IG and I love these because it's just like personal preference. Um, so Bilbo Bags wrote 420 wrote in wide or narrow leaf varietals. What's your favorite to grow and consume and why? Yeah. So uh, historically, you know, when we looked at the, the genetic spectrum, the wide varieties typically were more indica leaning type of strain and, and the long skinny ones were, were more sativa type of strain. Uh, sometimes with the amount of crosses that we've gone through these days, there's, it's really not one or the other. Uh, there's so many strains that lean one way or the other, or both ways, to, depending on what you're trying to analyze, you know, whether it's growth style or, um, THC response, THC or A response, you know, how, how do they make you feel head high, body high, uh, the mood, et cetera. Uh, I, I personally, um, historically have preferred sativas just cause, uh, I, I enjoy partaking when I'm out doing activities uh, in the forest and, and that kind of stuff. So I, uh, I, I prefer, I guess the, uh, the skinnier leaves, if you will, for uh, consumption. I like how we're referring to it around the leaf as opposed to the typical designation. So love that question. Thank you, Bilbo Bags 420. All right. Raymond just posted in the chat. What's up, Raymond? Um, you want to ask it yourself or you want me to ask for you? Sometimes I will ask. I got you. All right. During P2, how much dryback are we looking for before we irrigate? One to three percent or three to five percent? And why? Uh, great question. Uh, so obviously if we're running P2s, we're probably in a more vegetative type of irrigation strategy. And, uh, when we're looking at the, you know, the percentage drybacks, we always have to kind of keep in mind two things. What's the substrate size? Um, and then how much runoff are we getting? And so, you know, when, when we look at those aspects, yeah, you know, I, Let's go three percent, right? It gives you the, the the answer for both of them. Um, I you know I think generally we talk about you know two to three percent between irrigations for for vegetative, but uh, you know obviously if if you are looking for a little bit more runoff throughout the day, then then you can up those up to to mitigate any climbing EC that uh, you're wanting to avoid during your vegetative. So. <laughs> Best answer is look at your graphs, uh, analyze the response and make the adjustments that you need for the, the most ideal conditions based on the data you can capture. Thank you so much, Raymond, for your question. Great answer. Jason Forrest has another question for us here. He posts, we would like to see larger yields from our Mac one. Our numbers are in range with each phase. Would you suggest shortening the gen one phase for this particular cultivar? Yeah, uh, you know, Mac one's been around for quite a while. I have a lot of experience with it. It's probably one of the most generative leaning strains that that we see widely commercially available. Um, I've successfully seen Mac one, uh, you know, with one week of generative stacking. Um, so I don't know necessarily how how long you are pushing it right now. Uh, take those plant heights shoot for the, the ideal plant height that you're wanting. You know, we see the double and triple um, stacked grow rooms where they've got different levels. A lot of times they'll they'll pull in Mac one crosses uh, because they're a little bit more manageable in height and they can uh, take full advantage of those different tiers. Great, thank you for that. Um, you'll have to let us know if you have a follow-up question, um, but we are still getting uh, a lot of shout outs over on YouTube. Uh, Greg says, aloha and mahalo from Hawaii, a great educational series, and he's thanking you, Jason. So um, yeah, I wanted to make sure that you saw that. Um, what we got another question that came in, um, Baby Got Drybacks wants to know, what are some tasks that Arroya consolidates for growers and my team? Yeah. Uh, so let's just start off with data related tasks. Obviously, you know, if we're in there trying to capture environmental data, uh, 
you know, you can go through the, the whole day and, and get a bunch of data and it's not going to be anywhere near as much as you're capturing with Arroyo. So our environment and substrate sensors push a, a fresh data reading every three minutes. And so uh, I think historically just some of the challenges I had would be if we had a, a low high average uh, and, and an instant hygrometer, you know, I could come in the mornings and, you know, see a low of, of 60 and it doesn't give me any indication of, of why is it 60? Was it because I didn't close my, um, my vents in the greenhouse early enough at night to, to get past that? Was it because the, the early morning dip wasn't my, you know, my heaters weren't being able to keep up with that. So having that time series data is, I mean, <laughs> As far as tasking, it's way more valuable than just getting rid of that labor of, of capturing that data is because you can dig into to new insights and get a better understanding of facility performance. On the other hand, uh, one of my favorite things that we can do with tasking is rather than managing tasks manually, uh, you know, counting the day of harvest, updating a, a whiteboard every morning with what needs to be done, we can lay it out with a specific recipe for those strains. So in Arroyo, what those harvest group recipes basically are is laying out the, the entire lifespan of the plant and specifying it towards that plant's growth style. So when we look at uh, certain types of strains, you know, maybe we're running a specific number of days for each, uh, each growth phase for each steering phase, and we're going to line up our tasking and specific to you know, what that plant's needs are. Nice thing then is when we run a Nix group, we just apply that recipe and we might have, you know, 70 task events that are automatically lined out based on the, the day frame and you know, when that plant was born and when this needs to be done. Awesome. Thank you for that. Well, we're getting close to rounding out the hour for our show. Um, we do have another question. I think this might be the final question that we get to today. Um, it came in through YouTube. Diane wants to know, can defoliation slow down our flowering cycle to 10 or 11 weeks instead of nine or 10? What's your advice on that? Yeah. I mean, if you did over a D leaf that you're going to slow down that plant growth. So when we, we look at some of the effects of, of D leafing, it's, it's obviously the plant's response is that it needs to grow more new leaves and we want to make sure that it's growing more new buds instead of that. And so uh, another aspect is if we over deleaf, it's going to have a hard time capturing enough uh, photons to keep up with the photosynthetic rate that it's been at. So, uh, you know, there's, there's a chance if it's, you know, significantly over deleafed, you could be delaying the, the life cycle of that plant. Amazing. Yeah. Awesome. Yep. That was everything over on YouTube. We want to thank everyone for participating over there. Um, yeah. Keisha, any more questions from Instagram today? That is everything from Instagram. Not seeing anything on the chat. Jason held it down today. Solo. Jason, amazing. Thank you so much for covering all these topics. I think we broke a, a record today. I don't know if we've had so many questions before. I seriously think we got through our record today. Thank yeah, you. Amazing. So Jason, once again, thank you so much for another great conversation. Mandy, thanks for being my partner and moderating. To all of you who joined us here on the Hangouts or on YouTube, thank you so much for coming. This is really what it's about. Um, Oh, yes, yeah, Sean, we got you. Yes, we got your email address. Oh, yeah, you're definitely in the raffle, my friend. So fingers crossed. Hopefully you'll win a limited edition of a T-shirt. And to everybody else out there, um, thank you for, for joining us for Arroyo Office Hours. This is your hour. If you have any questions about Arroyo, you want to book a demo, uh, learn and hear from our experts so that you can find out how Arroyo can help improve your cultivation production process. Everything else, let us know if there's a topic you'd like covered in a future Office Hour session. Post it in the chat. Uh, send us an email at support.arroya at metergroup.com or send us a DM over Instagram. We want to hear from you. We record every session, so we'll email everyone in attendance a link to the video from today's discussion. It'll also be on the Arroya YouTube channel. Like, subscribe, and share while you are there. And if you find these conversations helpful, please do share with your network and spread the word. Jason and Mandy, until next time. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.